So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, did everybody get a chance to see that I graded your um, your homework number one? Did everybody get a chance to see that? Yes. Yeah. If you haven't, when you log into the classroom, uh, there's a tab called uh, student grades and you can see it there. Um, all right, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, if you have a, your TI-80 calculator, uh, take it out and have it handy, okay? Um, just out of curiosity, has anybody, does anyone not have a TI-80 calculator yet or it hasn't come in the mail yet? Anybody? Okay. Um, well, you know, thank you for, for letting us know. If you don't, and um, all right, so let me, the for anybody who doesn't have it or wants an emulator on their own computer, what I did was, if you look in the classroom, I renamed this link from textbook link to textbook and TI link. If you click on it, there's a link, the emulator that I use in class, you can actually download. So if you click this link here, you can download it for Windows or for Mac and um, you get a, a free 90 day trial. So if you, if you don't have a TI-80 calculator, you can actually download the emulator and you'll have the free 90 day trial will actually last until the end of class at this point. So, so if you wanna have it that way. Okay, just a few other things. Um, I posted your second homework. Um, after class today, you'll be able to answer all of homework number two, except for question number six. Okay, question number six, I'm gonna cover in class on Thursday and Tuesday of next week. Um, but you should definitely download homework number two and try all the problems except for number six. Um, and then, um, let's see. And then next Thursday, which would be the 18th, we have our first exam. So I'll, I'll talk more about that and the format of that, you know, in class on Thursday and on Tuesday of next week. But um, so just to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so those are the only announcements I have. But before I get started, does anybody have any questions about anything? I have a question on the last homework. Yeah, could you just speak up a little bit? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you explain how to get the standard deviation one more time? So, uh, yeah, when you look at the homework, um, anytime you can use a calculator in this class, you should use a calculator. So do you have a TI-83 or a TI-84 calculator? 83. So, all right, so you take your TI-83 and what you're gonna do is you're gonna press the stat button and under edit number one here, you're gonna edit the list and you're gonna input these values, six, 12, 13, five, 20, 17, and then 32. Yeah, I did that, but I don't know if I looked at the wrong um, symbol. Like I looked at the one that looks like an OX. Yeah, so you if you put this this sigma x right here, that stands for the population standard deviation. S sub x here, that stands for the sample standard deviation. So the correct answer was nine point two three seven. You know whatever. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And we're going to get to practice a lot with our calculators today as well. And then once you hit your input, what do you do? Hit stat after that to get those numbers up there. You go over to Calc, calc Bob. And that's um, one var stat. And don't worry, we're gonna practice. We're gonna practice this a bunch today. So don't stress too much about it. So we'll get some more practice with it. Okay, I got it. I just didn't know how I ended up with it. Okay. <laughs> that's all good. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I think um, we ended class last time. We were talking about box plots, if that rings a bell. And we ended up uh, just real briefly, we did one example like this. And then we did, I talked about some of the uses of box plots real quickly. And that's, that's where we ended. Uh, confirmation, sound correct? Correct. Okay. All right. 
So today, um, during the first hour of class, I want to um, cover just a little bit more box plots in this in IQR that we were talking about and, and we'll refresh all of that um, by now talking about outliers, okay? So this next section is what are outliers? And then we're also gonna talk about uh, how you show them on a box plot. Okay. All right, so what is an outlier? So all an outlier is, is it's, um, it's an unusual score relative to the rest of the data set. And the reason that it's important to identify outliers is um, outliers will warp or influence your mean and your standard deviation of your data set, okay? So um, a lot of times it's really important to identify an outlier. You know, this will be later on in your analysis, especially if you take more advanced methods courses, but to identify outliers and then decide if, if they're worth keeping in the data set or not. Okay, so a data set may have no outliers, one outlier, or it can have several outliers. Okay, and outliers can be values that are really, really high relative to the other values or really, really low relative to the other values, okay? So the way you identify outliers is by using what we call upper and lower limits. Sometimes you'll also hear me call these things as cutoffs. So upper and lower limits or cutoffs. Okay. And I wish I could tell you there was a scientific reason for these formulas, but there isn't. Um, these are just formulas that statisticians have agreed on um, as the cutoff values for identifying outliers. Okay. So the lower limit of this formula is Q1, okay, what does, Q1 stands for quartile one, minus this thing called the IQR, okay? Does anybody remember what the IQR stood for? What, it, you know, IQR, what's it really called? Interquartile range. It's the interquartile range. So it's the range of the middle 50% of data. And does anybody remember what the formula is for it? Me. <laughs> it's cute. I like your dry humor, Bob. It's Q3 minus Q1. Okay, that was the, the formula for the interquartile range. So to the lower limit here, you take the first quartile and you subtract 1.5 times this interquartile range. Any value below this is considered a lower outlier. The formula for the upper limit or upper cutoff value is Q3 plus 1.5 times this IQR. And any value above it um, would be considered an outlier, okay? All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna work through two examples uh, where, I, um, uh, <coughs> where I show you um, how you work with the data set, how you identify if it has an outlier using these formulas, and then how you graph this stuff um, in your graphing calculator. All right, so is everybody okay if I go on? Yes. I got one yes. All right. All right, so suppose I um, uh, have this data set here, okay? Um, and let's just suppose it's the number of minutes that a random sample of people spent watching uh, TV last night, okay? Um, like my wife and I, we actually ended up watching about an hour of TV last night. Um, we finished Cobra Kai on Netflix. Has anybody been watching that? Just out of curiosity. No, is that any good? Cobra Kai? Uh, yeah, it's, it's the Karate Kid Netflix. Oh, okay. So, have you ever- Professor, Professor, I actually do not have the time to watch TV lately. I say that again? I said we actually do not have the time to watch TV lately. I'm sorry to hear that. I, for me, it's, for me, it's a, a rarity. Well, we just decided, we just broke down instead of doing dishes last night. Oh, nice. All right, anyways, so let's go back to this problem. So you look at this data set and it looks like um, it's a random sample of 20 people and how much television they watch last night. Just looking at the data values, okay? Uh, do any of them seem like they might, might be, um, do any of them seem like they might be outliers compared to the rest of the data values? 
Yes, 66. Okay, 66 could be an outlier. Absolutely. How about any other one? Five. Yeah, so yeah, maybe. So here's, here's the thing. The answer, the correct answer to both those things are like maybe 66 and maybe five. Maybe these are outliers. So what you have to do um, for this is you have to make sure by calculating these cutoffs. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to walk you through a bunch of questions. Okay. Question one for this. Let's find the quartiles. All right. So Everybody, if you have it with you, grab your calculator. I'm going to work all of this in the TI-84 calculator, but the options in the TI-83 are exactly the same, okay? Um, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take these 20 data values and input it into my calculator. So everybody hit the stat button on their calculator. And under edit, edit number one here, this edit allows me to input data. So I'm just going to hit enter. All right, how many people have data from the previous class still saved in their calculator? Oh boy, I do. Yep, that's okay. You notice that I do too. So the way you're going to clear it out is you're going to take your little arrow key and you're going to scroll up to the top of L1 and then you're going to hit clear and then enter. Never hit delete. Never, ever, ever hit delete, okay? It's clear then enter, all right? Does anybody need to see me redo that? Everybody okay with me on this one? Wait a minute, I'm not clearing here. What am I doing? Clear? Okay, so if you have data in your calculator, like I just have a couple numbers here, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your mouse key here and you're gonna scroll to the top of L1 and then you're gonna hit this clear button and then you're gonna hit enter and it should clear the data. Thank you, got it. Okay. All right now, just what we all have to do is we have to take all this data and it doesn't matter how you put it in, um, but just start putting the data into your calculator. So 25, 66, 34, 30, 41, 35. If you need to delete a single number, you can actually just put your black cursor over it and then hit delete on that. That you can do, but you don't wanna to go to the top of L1 and hit delete. So just keep going through. I know it's a pain to put 20 data values in, but. We're gonna do it. Okay. So I, what I've done is I've taken the 20 data values and I've plugged it in, all right? And what we're never going to do in this class is these, these calculations by hand to find the quartiles, okay? If our calculator can do it, we're going to rely on technology for our calculator to do it. So after you have the data plugged in, I'm going to go back to the stat button. You guys, hopefully everyone can see my mouse circling over the stat button. And then I want to scroll over to this calc here. So I'm going to scroll over to calc. And then under number one here, under this one dash bar stats, I'm going to hit enter. All right. If you have a TI 83, what you don't, you do not see what I have here. What it just says is one dash bar stats. Okay. If you have that, just hit enter again. Just go boop, just hit enter. Could you go back after you got all your data entered? What do you do? You hit the stat button. And then you got to scroll over to calc. So you're going to hit your little, your little arrow key over to calc. Yep. And then it should be highlighted here under number one that says one dash bar stats. Yes, I got that. So you're just going to hit enter. <clears throat> and then now what you're going to do, if you have a TI-83, just hit enter again. If you have this TI-84, you're going to scroll down to calculate. And hopefully, this is what you guys see. All right, how many people see this on their screen? Melissa, great. Okay, good, bunch of people. Awesome, awesome. So you'll notice that this has this little arrow pointing down. Just scroll down and you can see right here, it tells you what the quartiles are. 
It says quartile one is 23, the median is 30.5, and quartile three is 36.5, right? Everyone else got those same values? Okay. So quartile one was 23, quartile two was 30, and I'm sorry, it was quartile three, uh, was it 36.5? Yes. Yeah, and, and quartile and two was 30.5. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I have a terrible memory. Sorry about that. Just don't forget your wife's name. Oh uh, my gosh, what is it? What is it? Uh, no, but still Ashley. Okay, I remembered. My favorite, my favorite game with her though is to pretend that I forget her birthday or our anniversary by a day. And I'm like, oh, we're gonna celebrate your birthday. And, and then she could, you know, all right, you know what? It is cool. I'm gonna, why am I saying this? So that we gotta get back to math. Okay. Uh, what, what do you press to calculate? So Marissa, are you, um, do you have a TI-83 or TI-84? Marissa? 84, yeah. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go scroll over to calc here and it's number one, one var stat. And then you're just gonna scroll down till you hit calculate. Okay, good. All right, question two. Let's calculate the IQR, the interquartile range, okay? So that IQR is Q3 minus Q1, okay? So you're gonna take this 36.5 and you're gonna subtract away the quartile one, which is 23. And when you do this, okay, when you do this, I think you get the value 13.5. Yep. Okay. Now, question three. So we thought maybe the 66 and maybe the five are outliers. Okay, so what we're gonna have to do now is we're gonna have to identify any outliers. Okay, to do that, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to calculate these lower and upper limits here. Okay, so the lower limit. Okay, all it is is just this formula, Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. So you're gonna take this value of 23 and you're gonna subtract away 1.5 times this 13.5 you just calculated. So it's 23 minus 1.5 times 13.5. And you should get this. Okay, you should get 2.75. All right, is there so this is how you, you use the lower, the lower limit here. Look at your data set. Is there any number less than 2.75? Okay, nope, you know what that means? Five is not an outlier, okay? It has to be lower than this lower limit. So there is no lower outlier. So even though we thought maybe, maybe the five was an outlier, that's actually not the case, okay? Well, let's now see if that 66 is an outlier, okay? All right, so the upper limit is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. So you're gonna take your 36.5 and you're gonna add 1.5 times 13.5. So 36.5 plus 1.5 times this 13.5, this IQR. 
and you get 56.75. You have an outlier. Yep. Is there any number greater than that? So uh, the 1.5, um, where does it come from? Uh, I wish I could tell you there was a scientific reason for it, okay? But there isn't. This is just what statisticians have agreed on. They, they, they think this is a reasonable calculation to determine if, um, if a data value is far enough uh, from, you know, from the other values to be an outlier. So there is no scientific reason to where the 1.5 came from. I, I'm sorry, I wish I could tell you why. Okay, so what you do is you look back here and you say, okay, this is an outlier because it's greater than our cutoff. So 66 is an upper outlier. Okay, question four. Uh, sketch the box plot. showing the outlier, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sketch this box plot by hand now, all right? What you'll notice on your homework, just to show you real quick, on your homeworks, um, I give you the, um, uh, the, 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 the number line for the box plots, okay? But so when I'm gonna do this freehand, I'm gonna set it up, okay? So you need to draw this number line, okay? It needs to be able to go from five to 66. So I'm gonna start at zero and I'm gonna go every five. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, and then 70. Okay. All right, so to do the box plot by hand, the first thing you're gonna have to sketch is quartile one. So you're gonna go to 23 and I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm gonna put a vertical line. Then I'm gonna go to quartile three, 36.5. Okay, here's 35. So 36.5 is over here. And then you're gonna connect them with the box. Like so. Then you put in quartile two, 30.5, which is like right here. Okay. The next thing you have to do, that's the box. Now this is sometimes called the box and whisker plots because now you have to draw the whiskers. Okay, so let's go down to our minimum value, which is five. And you're gonna draw a whisker out to five. All right, now how you show an outlier in a box plot is very, very specific, okay? Where this number 66 is on, on, your, on your plot here, you're not gonna draw the whisker out to 66. Okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a little asterisk like this. Okay, that signifies the outlier. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna look in your data set. Okay, what is the next highest value in the data set that is not an outlier? What do you guys see? Is it, is it, no, I, I think it's not. Yep, nope, yep, it's 41, okay. So then what you're going to do is you're actually going to draw the box plot. How about 43? Yeah, why not 43? Where's 43? Did I, yeah, oh, you know what? I right. did that on, I did that on purpose to see who, was, who would catch that. So well done. Yeah. Thank you. 43. Do you guys believe me that I did that on purpose? 100%. 100%, yeah. 100%, yeah. So you're going to go out to 43. And that's where you're gonna draw the box plot to, the whisk or two, okay? I just want to um, uh, highlight here a common error I see when I grade homeworks. 
a lot of times people plot the upper and lower limit, like they'll draw the whisker out to 56.7, but you don't do that. Okay, these are just cutoff values. They, they, they do not go on your box plot, okay? So that's why it's important to identify the outlier. It shows it as a do, 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 as a little asterisk like this. All right, what do you think? I'm sorry, I'm confused on the box plot. Can you explain it real quick one more time? Yeah, how I sketched it? Yeah. Okay, yep. So here, this first vertical line is quartile one. It's, it's 23. This vertical line here is quartile three. And then I made the box. And then this vertical line is quartile two, like so. And then this is the minimum value down here, which was that five. If you have an outlier, you put it as an asterisk like this. And then you draw the whisker out to the next highest value that is not an outlier. So it's the max value that is not outlier. Um, professor, how about if we have an um, a lower outlier? Yep, you can you can have that. So let's don't don't sketch this on your graph, everybody. But if suppose five was an outlier, yep, several outliers. Let me show you. Suppose you had a box plot, right, and it looked like this. Okay, if you have had um, five as the outlier, you, like you did your analysis and it turned out that five was an outlier, you would put a little asterisk there and then you would go to 15 because that's the minimum value. Thank you. Okay. Yep, here you go to 43. And suppose you had two upper outliers, like two values that went past 56.75, you would just show them wherever they were. Like that. that's how you would do it. Wherever you have the outlier, boom, done, like that. Then we'll go to the third next yeah. upper number. Yes. Yep. You go to whatever the value, the next value to it is not an outlier. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you always have to, if I ask you to, like in your homework here, where are you? In your homework here, um, problem number one just says sketch the box plot doesn't ask you to check for outliers. You don't have to there. But problem number seven asks you to identify outliers. That's when you'd have to check for them. OK. Yep. All right, let's just, how about we just do um, one more uh, problem. Does that sound OK? Perfect. OK, just so we all have it. Uh, can you please show us how to box plot? Yep. So let me show you, I'll, I'll do this right now, just cause it's asked how to show this in the calculator. All right, that's a good segue here. So it turns out um, you can also graph this in your calculator, okay? Um, so everybody, you should have here, your data from this example still plugged in L1, okay? So if you want your calculator to, to plot this, what you can do is you can click on stat plot here. So go second function, stat plot. So just so, just so you're clear what I did there was I went second function, stat plot. Under one here where it says plot one dot 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 on, do you notice? I, I did not see how you, Click on second plot. Um, Set stat plot up. Did you see my mouse? Yes. If you have a TI-83, it's the same option. So you just, you're just going to go, you're going to click second function. Yes. And then just Y equals. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Under number one here. Do you see how it, uh, we have, if you, if you haven't changed anything from the last class, it should be the box plot here. But do you notice right next to it, you have this box plot with these little dots. So scroll down to type and click on this one here, okay? What this will do is if you have any outliers in your data set, it will identify them for you. So the next thing you're gonna wanna do is whenever you wanna do a stat plot, click the zoom button on your calculator, zoom. And you want option number nine, you want the zoom stat. 
and you should see something that looks like that on your calculator. How many people see that on their calculator? Yep. Do you notice something? Check this out. Look at the box. Go ahead. Invalid. Say it. I'm sorry. I got invalid. Invalid. Uh, Number one, quit. Yeah. What probably ended up happening. Uh, it's so hard virtual because like normally if we were in class in person, they just grab your calculator and fix it for you. Um, I'll have to troubleshoot it during the break or after class for you, Robert. All right, well, how Professor, would I Professor, can you repeat the steps again? Yeah, yeah, but I was just talking to somebody, so. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Can I get back to, can I get back to where I was before? Because I was on the graphs. Yeah, so hit second function. I'm gonna, this is gonna redo it. You're gonna hit second function stat plot. It's, it should say plot one dot, dot, dot on. And you're gonna scroll down to type and you're gonna click on this one and just hit enter. And then you're gonna hit the zoom button And then you're going to scroll down to number nine for zoom step. And you should see this. And if you don't see this, uh, I, I, what I will do is I will help people during the break or after class to help them get their calculator set. And the last step there, scroll down to number nine and hit what? And Is then that... hit enter, Bob. Yep. Okay, Professor, I have. Plot plot one and below that I have on or off. You then I have then I have type. You have on. You want it on. Okay. Yep. Like you want it on. And but then I, but I have okay okay on. Then next. Then you want this type selected right here. Okay. Okay. I did. I did. Okay. What's the problem? Um, it's still showing me the same thing. X list frequency mark. Does it say L1 here? Yes, it, it does. And when you hit zoom and then press number nine. So go to L1. Or no. just hit. Okay. Then just hit zoom. Zoom. Okay. And then press the number nine button. And you oh, thank, thank you. I got it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. And you'll notice that this one looks ex exactly like mine down here, okay? And it shows you where the outlier is. So like, you, you know, you'll have to calculate these cutoffs on your homework and on the first exam, but like if you can use your calculator to know that, oh yeah, that 66 should be one outlier. And if there's more than one outlier, your calculator will pick it up for you. All right, we're gonna just do another one real quick, okay? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to make up a data set here, okay? Just just to speed things up a little bit. Um, suppose you have this data set of commute times, okay? And here is the data set. Okay, and this is how long it takes people to get from their homes to WCC's campus, okay? One person it takes 2 minutes, somebody else it takes 12, 15, 22, 25, 25, 30, 45, 45, uh, 50, somebody takes 65 minutes. Okay, somebody it takes another 65, then there's somebody who takes 70 minutes. All right, then I always like to add this because you can definitely see there's an outlier. Um, back when we used to go to campus um, for our lectures, every once in a while I would take public transit to work. All right, so I take public transit from work involves me getting on a New Jersey transit train to Penn Station, then hopping the seven train to Grand Central, then taking Metro North um, up to White Plains Transit Center, and then hopping on the B line to campus. Uh, I always do that once a year. Um, I don't know why, I just, I, I bring a book, I get a couple hours to myself, uh, but it takes me 180 minutes each way, okay? So I get a nice three hour commute when I do that. All right, the reason I wanted to do that, okay, um, looking at this data set, okay, are there any values that look like they could be outliers in the data set? 180. Yeah, definitely 180. And then here's the thing. maybe, maybe, maybe the number two is. We don't know, maybe. Okay, so that's why we need to 
go through and do exactly what we just did again, okay? So let's calculate the quartiles and the IQR. All right, so grab your trusty calculator, okay? And what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to input this data into our calculator again. So everybody hit the stat button and under number one, all right, we're gonna go to the top of the list and clear it out, okay? Uh, John, I just got sent a private message. Don't worry about it, no big deal. You can catch up and watch the, uh, the, the, the recording. Uh, so let's begin the process of plugging these numbers in. 2, 12, 15. Yep. Um, the calculator covers the, the numbers. I, I know. Oh, so we don't have to end. Un oh, OK. So 25, 25, 30, 45, 45. Fifty, sixty-five, sixty-five, and then seventy and one eighty. And let me—I'll move my calculator so that you can see the the numbers here on your own. Okay, to let you plug them in. Okay, so what you what you don't want to do is, and again, anytime your calculator can do something, have your calculator do it. Okay, save yourself some trouble. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to hit the. Does everybody anybody still need the numbers? Uh, Bob, I, I I will help you with your calculator uh, when we go to break. Okay, um, just just like watch me for now, and then we'll come back to your calculator problem. All right, um, don't worry about it. Uh, everyone who's texting me privately for any, any issues you're having. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna hit the stat button. We're gonna scroll over to calc and it's option number one, okay? So you're gonna, then you're gonna go down to calculate and thank you in the chat there. And you're gonna see the quartiles. So quartile one is 22. Quartile two is 37.5 and quartile three is 65. And 65. Okay. So what was the formula for the IQR again? It was Q3 minus what? Q1. Yep. 1.5. 1.5. 1. Yep. No, it's Q3 minus Q1, just for oh, the interquartile range. Yeah. So oh, it's, yeah. it's 65 minus 22. Uh, what does that get you? Does that get you 43? Yeah. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is let's identify any outliers. Okay, so this, again, you're gonna to need to go back and you're gonna to need to use these formulas here, okay? <clears throat> so the lower limit So the lower limit here is Q1 minus 1.5 times that IQR. So it's 22 minus 1.5 times 43.
So the, this one is minus 42.5. So um, is there any lower outlier? So no. the, yeah, no, the two, there's no value less than minus 42.5. So, so that means the two is not an outlier again. So the upper limit is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR. Uh, so that is 65 plus 1.5 times 43. And you get 129.5. So is there uh, an upper outlier? Yep, yeah, you can see it's the 180. Yep, because that's the only value greater than the, the upper limit, okay? So I'm not gonna draw this uh, by hand, okay? I just wanna show you again how you do this on your um, calculator, okay? If you have the data plugged in and you have, still have the same exact settings, all you're gonna do is you're just gonna hit zoom and then number nine, and it will just sketch the, 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 the box plot for you, okay? <coughs> So when you sketch the box plot on your graphing calculator, did anybody else get this exact visual here? Yeah. 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 And you can see that your calculator says, hey, that 180, that's a crazy outlier there. Okay. Why is there, I'm sorry, why is there no stem to the 180? So you never draw the stem to the outlet. Okay. Um, the what? I'm sorry, cut out. Uh, you never draw the stem to the outlier. So if there's an outlier, it's like unusual relative to the other values. So that's why like when I did mine by hand, it gets the special little doo -doo 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 asterisk. And then you draw the stem out to the next highest value that's not an outlier, which is exactly what you see here. It says that 180 is an outlier. So it's drawing the stem to the number 70 instead. Okay. All right, what do you guys think? Not too bad, it's okay. It's now becoming interesting. <laughs> awesome with the calculator. <laughs> now it's finally interesting, okay. Um, I gotta move on. The outlier, it the, the outlier, not every data set has an outlier. Um, so you can have a lower outlier, you can have an upper outlier. Um, like, let me give you a hint when you do your homework. If you look at your homework here, question number seven, look at the data set here, okay? What number in this data set looks like the outlier? Is 110. It, does 110 look like an outlier or, or does this one? 10. 10, 10. So it's not always just the highest number. The highest number to data set doesn't have doesn't necessarily mean it's not outlier. Like you have to do these cutoff values. You have to look at the the upper limit and the lower limit, the upper cutoff, lower cutoff, and see if there's any numbers outside of those cutoff values. If you're outside of those cutoff values, you're an outlier. Okay. All right. Look, I, at this point, I, I'm sorry. I got to move on to a new topic. Um, uh, here's, here's the deal. You got a chance to practice all this stuff on your homework this week on question number one and question number uh, seven on the homework. So I encourage you like after class today, while this stuff is still like fresh in your mind to maybe just tackle those two problems, you know? Um, and then what I'll do is on Thursday, if people have questions, I'll answer them. Does that sound okay? Okay. All right. All right. So I, there's, there's another question here, question number three, that has to deal with age of actresses at the first time they won their first Oscar. You can um, do that on your own if you want some extra practice and I can look it over for you. Um, but what I want to do now is if you go back into the classroom, actually still, we're still under the week two lectures. I want to do this Z-scores lecture, lecture number five, okay? So let me just get through lecture number five and then we'll go to break, okay?
It shouldn't take me too long. Okay. Z scores. Um, so before I give you a definition of what a Z score is, I want to, um, uh, I'm gonna introduce this topic of Z scores and why it's needed with an example, okay? All right, so suppose you have two teachers, okay? You got teacher Jeff, okay? Jeff makes $70,000 a year and you have teacher Nicole and Nicole makes $60,000 a year, okay? Who would you say is better off? Like, just 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 comparing their income, who would you say is better off? Okay, why, why is Jeff better off? I mean, it's, this is not a trick question, okay? Why is Jeff better off? He makes more money. Yeah, Jeff makes way more money, that's fine. Okay, but so sometimes this type of stuff is not a fair direct comparison if you if I give you a few more data items, data points, okay? So let me give you some extra info, okay? Jeff lives in New York City and Nicole lives in Albany, New York. Nicole. Okay, who's better off now? Nicole. Why, why would you say that? Because it's less expensive. Okay, I mean, you know, I grew up outside of Albany. You know, Albany's a nice place, you know. Um, but like cost of living, look, cost of living is much, much cheaper in um, Albany. But like, so here's the trade off, right? Like it, Jeff makes $10,000 more. Does that offset the cost of living? You know, like, plus there's a lot of intangibles living in New York City compared to living in Albany. I'm not saying, I mean, I grew up in Albany. Albany was a great place. Trust me. Okay. Um, but like, what I'm getting at here is it's an unfair direct comparison. Okay. Now we still want to figure out who's better, better off. Okay. We want to put a mathematical formula to it. Um, so to do this, it's, it's better to compare what we call their relative position to their peers. Okay. So relative position. And to do this, I need, you need to know a few things. You need to know the mean and standard deviation um, for salaries in these locations. So in New York City, the mean teacher salary is $80,000. And let me just say something. I'm also just making these numbers up. I don't know what the, the real mean salaries are, okay? Let's just say the supposed New York City, the mean teacher salary is $80,000 a year with a standard deviation of 20. And in Albany, the mean is um, 50,000 with a standard deviation of five, okay? Now who is better off relative to their peers and why? What would you say? Well, how much was Jeff making again? 70K. Okay. And how much was Nicole making? 60. Let me ask this. Does Jeff make above or below the average teacher salary in New York City? Below. He makes below. Nicole, does she make above or below the average salary, teacher salary in Albany? So Nicole's above. So now who is better, who's doing better relative to their peers? Nicole. Nicole, right? Nicole's making more than the mean. Jeff is making less than the mean um, in the relative areas. Now we can say who's better off relative to their peers, okay? Now, I mean, to be fair, Jeff is in New York City. I mean, they got the Yankees, you know, the Mets, yeah, you know, the Broadway, the opera, all this cool stuff, you know, and Nicole's stuck in New York. So it's still like, or in, in Albany, but like, just relative to their peers now, you're able to say um, who's better off. So now I wanna put a mathematical formula to this, okay? And this is what's called the Z-score, all right? This is also called standardizing uh, a variable, all right? We're creating a standardized variable. So for any variable X, okay? And so for our example, X is equal to the salary the person is making. We 
we have this variable, okay? This is actually what's called like a, a mathematical transformation. And we always denote it as Z is equal to, X is the variable minus, and then we have this Greek letter mu. Okay, does anybody remember um, what the Greek letter mu stands for? The population mean. So you're going to take their salary, you're going to subtract away the mean. And if you look, I tell you the mean in each of them. And then you're going to divide that calculation by sigma. Does anybody remember what sigma stood for? The sample. Uh, population standard deviation. Okay. okay. I get it. There's like a, so much notation and stuff in this class. I understand There's a lot going on. Okay, this new Z value, okay, we call a Z score is called also called the standardized version of X or the standard variable corresponding to the variable X. Okay, so what does a Z score um, uh, really tell us here? So what a Z score tells you how far a data value is from the mean. So the mean is the average, right? In terms of standard deviations. Okay. So Z-scores are unitless measures um, and they're just gonna be numbers like three. So if somebody has a Z, if a variable has a Z-score of three, it just means it's three standard deviations above the mean. If a Z-score comes back as minus 0.55, it just means the variable is 0.55 standard deviations below the mean. That's all it is, okay? All right, so look, let's, let's take this very simple formula and let's calculate the z-scores for Jeff and Nicole and, 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 and talk about how you compare them then. Is everybody okay? Um, everybody okay if I go to the next slide? Golden. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna burn through this quick example, then we'll do one by hand and then we'll take our break, okay? Um, all right, so this is how you calculate Jeff's Z-score, okay? It's his variable, his value, which is 70,000, okay, minus the mean teacher salary, which was 80,000, divided by the standard deviation, which was 20,000. Okay, so his Z-score is minus 0 0.5, if you were to plug this in your calculator. So what this is saying is Jeff is making half a standard deviation below the average teacher salary in New York City. All right, so Jeff's actually not doing that good, okay? Now, Nicole, on the other hand, okay? Nicole's X variable is 60,000 minus the mean, the mean teacher salary in Albany was 50,000 and the standard deviation for teacher salary was 5,000. Well, Nicole, if you would plug this in your calculator, is two standard deviations above the mean. So she's way above the mean where Jeff is like way below the mean. Okay, so what we see here is that Nicole is actually better off just by looking at the z-score. Okay. Um, what do you guys think? Not too bad? What? All right. How about well, we do? Well, go on ahead. The X is their salaries, and the I forgot the name of the symbol. That's you. That's the mean. Okay. And sigma is the standard deviation. Let me. Uh, let's work one by hand now, and it'll be a little bit easier. Okay. Professor, how do you get the twenty thousand and the five thousand? The population. Those it's going to be given. Like I told you, I'll give it to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Let's work a problem by hand and then you can see what it'll look like. Because this, this problem I'm going to do next mirrors the one that's on your homework. 
and uh, the one that's, um, oh my God, why am I struggling? Uh, on your exam. Okay. Here we go. This is comparing two test scores. All right, so we got this person, Mark, okay? And he's taking a calculus class, okay? And Mark took a calculus final exam and he scored a 71, okay? Now the mean, okay, the mean exam score, so they tell you the mean, which is mu and calculus was a 76 and the standard deviation was five. Okay, so Mark, uh, he, did, he didn't do, he did below the, below the average, okay. Steve took an economics, so we got Steve. Economics final exam, and he scored a 75, okay. In the economics exam, the mean was an 88. And the standard deviation sigma was a 10. Okay, so what we want to figure out now is who did better relatively. Okay. And look, it's an unfair direct comparison to just say, well, Steve got a 75 and Mark got a 71. Why isn't it an unfair direct comparison, real quick? We have to compare it with their peers. Yeah, like it, 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 our calculus is classes different than economics classes. Like, which one do you guys think is generally harder? Cal calculus. Ooh, so you want to you hear something funny? So I have, a, <clears throat> I have two master's degrees, one in economics and one in math. And I'll tell you this, actually, I think economics is harder. But a lot of people would, would disagree with me. I've uh, never done any of them. Both are great classes. If, um, if I were to if I, count two, is, is Calc 2 is the hardest class that you'll ever take in, in, as a math class, Melissa, if that's what you mean. Um, but anyways, it is. It's really hard. All right, let's just do these z-scores real quick. So just an unfair direct comparison because there's two different courses. So Mark's z-score. Uh, you're going to take the x variable minus the mean, and you're just going to divide it by the standard deviation. So Mark scored a 71 minus a 76. And you're gonna divide that by the standard deviation of five. Well, you get 71 minus 76 is minus five over five. Okay, so that ends up being Mark here. He scored one standard deviation below the mean on his calculus final exam. Steve on his economics. Uh, his X is 75. The mean was an 88. Standard deviation was 10. 75 minus 88. Oh my God. I think you get minus 13. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> and you get 13 divided by 10, you get minus 1.3. So he's further below the mean. Okay, his Z score is minus 1.3. So who did relatively better on their, on their exam, do you think? Mark. Mark did, right? Mark is closer to the mean in this case, okay? All right, so I, I hope it helps seeing me do this. Um, this example was it not too bad it was okay <laughs> not bad wait, wait how do you know who's closer is it whoever is um closer to the uh so it, it, it's weird right like so negative numbers work different than positive numbers right so like relatively better you want the number to be smaller if it's negative like this is this is negative one is a larger number than minus 1.3, right? Like negative, you know, cause it's closer to being positive. Um, whereas here, you know, two away from the mean is better than minus being below the mean. So it, it really just depends on the context of the problem.
All right, you'll get a you'll get a chance to um, work on this on your homework. Okay, so on your homework, where are your homework? Dun, 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 dun. On your homework here, I believe problem number four um, is a problem just like this. So you can you can try this, and I'll answer questions on this on Thursday. Okay. All right, let's let's take a um, a five minute break if that's okay with everybody. So we'll start back up at two oh six. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. All right. Uh, how many people were having a little bit of calculator problems? So during this break. Yes, when we come back, we're starting with the correlation uh, one. Okay, so what I wanna do, if, if you don't have to say anything in the chat or anything if you're having calculator problems, but uh, what I wanna do, if you are having calculator problems during the break here, uh, I just wanna reset your calculator and then um, just reset the settings for you, okay? So that um, you know, we'll all be on the same page, okay? So I'm going to do it on the TI-84, but it's the same thing if, if you have a TI-83, okay? So everybody, if you want to reset your calculator, hit second function, and then the plus sign, that's second function memory. And then option number seven, so just press seven. And then option number one, press one and then option number two to reset it. And you should see something like this on your screen. Okay. Does anybody need me to see me do that again? Yes. Okay. Yep, no problem. All right, Bob, press second function, memory, so second function and then the plus key. Do you see this on your screen? Yes. And then just, Bob, just, just go, just press these numbers. Okay, just listen to me. Just go seven, one, two. Seven, one, two. Done. Done, boom. Now hit second function. And then the y equals here. And do you see this, Bob? Where's the y equal? Right here. See my mouse? Oh, yeah. It's that far. Yep. And do you see this? Yes. Under number one here, just hit enter. And then do you see how it's blinking on on? Yeah. Just hit enter again. Blinking, yeah. Okay. Now just hit second function. And then do you see where it says quit here? Yep. And just do that. Okay. All right. No That's it. That's it. And then we come back in two minutes. I just need a two minute break just to grab a soda. Yeah. And then we'll we'll pick up. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. welcome.
All right, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, let's let me just let's just let this save. All right, so now just you're able to do it on your homework every problem but problem number um, six now. So on Thursday when we come back, I will spend you know the first five, 10 minutes just answering any homework questions. I'll even spend 15 if people try it and get stuck, but you should really, really um, uh, give those problems a shot. Okay, so now we're gonna finally move into week three. So if you haven't already done so, download this um, correlation lecture and have it handy, okay? Sorry if you guys, I'm, I'm having a Diet Coke, so forgive me, a little rude of me, but my apologies if you hear that in the background. No coffee? I know I already had my whole pot this morning. When has that stopped you? I'm sorry? I said, when has that stopped you? When does that stop me? It rarely does, but I'm trying to cut back at one pot. I think, I think that's good, you know? My son got, got my wife and I up around four, the four or 4.30 this morning. So it's just a little, so oh, I've switched. Going in? I'm sorry? Have, is, is, is he teething? I mean, he'll be teething for the next like two years, but yes, he's just. Well, I know that. I'm just saying, is it like getting to the core of it? Is like this, or just a random 4 a.m. wake up? Uh, he has six teeth now. So I think, I think what he thought was um, you guys, you guys didn't do dishes and had a fun night last night after I went to bed. So let me get, get even with you. That's what I personally think he was thinking, but I'm sure he was just uncomfortable, but gotcha. yeah. nobody laughs at those bad jokes little too. Okay. All right. All right. So let's move on now uh, into correlation and regression. And what this topic is, is this topic, what we want to do with both these things is we want to study the relationship between two variables. Okay, and um, the first thing what we want to do is we want to measure the strength of that relationship. That's called correlation. And then what we want to do is we want to model the relationship. Okay, and that's what we're going to learn is called regression. And look, it is incredibly important, incredibly, incredibly important um, that you have your graphing calculators with you on Thursday. And if you don't have the TI-84 that you download that emulator I showed you at the beginning of class, um, because we're going to change a lot of like the default settings in your calculator. Um, so you want to like have it handy with you when we do it. Okay, it's incredibly important. All right, so the first problem we're gonna do um, is we're gonna work at this example here, okay? So suppose your instructor is interested in seeing if the amount of time uh, a student spends studying has an influence on their grade, okay? So just imagine that um, for a recent exam in, in, in his stack course, so my stack course, your instructor, what he randomly did was I randomly sample eight students. And I said, okay, how many hours did you spend studying for this exam? Okay, so for each student, okay, they have two variables associated with them. One is hours of study and one is exam. So this is like student one. This was the second student and so on. 
So I'm not going to just read through them all, but just like briefly, you know, one student was like, oh, I only studied for, for one hour and they got a 50 on the exam. Okay, all the way up to one student was like, hey, I studied for nine hours and I got an 88 on the exam. Okay. So look at the values here. Okay. What type of relationship do you think you're seeing here? Positive correlation. Okay, so it looks like you're saying there's a positive relationship. Yes. Okay, what is a positive relationship? What does that even mean though? Like, like that increase in the hours of study is it's equal to or measures directly with an increase in the exam grade. Yeah, so a positive relationship means like when one variable goes up, so does the other. Okay, so it looks like we, we're seeing like a, a some type of positive uh, relationship here, right? And so what we want to do now is over the next, this lecture and on Thursday, uh, what I want to show you is I want to show you a measure for this, how you can show the strength of that relationship. And then we're going to model that relationship. Okay. So when you have two variables um, and you want to talk about how they're related, um, we define the two variables as being one of the following two things. We have what's called a response variable. And this is the variable whose value can be explained by the value of the explanatory or predictor variable. So we have this first thing called the explanatory variable. And then we have something called the response variable. Generally in mathematics, when we have two variables, what letters do we use to represent those variables? X and Y. X and Y, okay. So we generally put the explanatory variable as the X variable and the response variable as the Y variable. We consider this explanatory variable to be the independent variable. And the Y variable to be the dependent variable. So another way of saying that is, look, the value of y depends on the value of x, okay? Or x explains, x explains the value of y. So here were our two variables. We had hours of study and we had exam scores, okay? Which one do you think is the explanatory variable? Exam grade. So do you think exam grade, exams grade explains the hours of study or do you think hours of study explains the exam score? Hmm. Samantha, why do you think hours of study is the explanatory? But if you want to turn your mic on or you can write in chat, it doesn't matter. You're right, you're, you're right. So that's why I'm asking you. Like, uh, so maybe, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, 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 I'll continue on with what Samantha put there in the chat, but like, yeah, I think, would you guys agree that like, generally you input, you determine the hours of study and then that impacts your exam score. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. I don't understand professor. What do you mean? What, what have you just said? So you said you, you, mm -hmm. So you get to pick how much you're going to study for an exam, right? Would you agree? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And would you would you agree that like the hours you put in has been impact on your exam scores? Yes. Yeah. So that's what I mean by it's your explanatory variable. Like your your hours of study to a certain degree explain what you score on your exam. Okay. Yeah. So that means our response variable, our dependent variable, the hours, the excuse me, the exam score depends on how many hours you study. Yes, no, I understand. Yep, good, awesome. All right, so we have these, so you, you can kind of see where this is going, right? Like when, when, when you have two variables, X and Y, like eventually we're going to like have some type of equation for the two variables. That's, that, that's, that's where we're going with this. Okay, 
So you really need to know what, what, what's your explanatory value and your response value before you proceed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we'll do is, um, you'll notice as the class goes on, um, I'll give you data sets, especially next class, not so much this class, but especially next class. Um, and, and the first thing you're going to have to do is pick one, pick what is the explanatory, pick what, what is the response. Okay. Generally on like on your homework though, I do it for you <laughs> just to make it a little bit easier for you. Okay. On this homework. But uh, when it comes to uh, some of the harder problems we do next class, the first thing I'll say is, Hey, which is your explanatory, which is your response. All right, so now what we wanna do, um, if you think about how this class has proceeded over the last two weeks, right? So I give you a set of data. And then the first thing we, we did was, oh, what's a visual representation of the data before we jumped into the numerical analysis? Um, so what we have, what's called the scatter diagram, or you'll actually hear me call it a scatter plot in class. And this is a graph that shows the relationship between two quantitative variables measured on the same individual. Well, that's what we have. I'm just going to go back for a second. Um, we have two quantitative variables, hours of study and exam score on the same individual. Okay. Now each individual in the data set is represented by a point on this scatter diagram. Okay. So if you think about it, let me just go back here. We said hours of study were X, exam score is Y. We're just gonna plot our two variables like ordered pairs, okay? So you're gonna plot the X and Y variables. As ordered pairs. Okay, like you would on a graph, like if you remember from your algebra graph or algebra graph, algebra classes, excuse me. So the explanatory variable is plotted on the horizontal axis and the response variable is plotted on the vertical axis. So when you sketch this scatter plot, this is, this is basically what's gonna happen. Along the horizontal axis, you're gonna label as your X variable. And up here, you're gonna label as your Y variable. Okay, and then you're gonna plot the points as ordered pairs like this. All right, I added a blank page to the slides. So if you have the slides printed out, I don't have this blank page handy in there, but what I wanna do is I wanna take and I wanna actually by hand really quickly show the scatter plot for this, okay? So let's construct the scatter plot. for our example. And so what I'm gonna do here, just to have it handy. Um, what I encourage you to do is just kind of follow along with me while I do this, okay? Cause you're gonna have to replicate this on your first home. So if I wanna draw a scatter plot, using what we have here. You're gonna start by drawing the first quadrant of the Cartesian plane, like so. Okay. Now along the horizontal axis, you get the X variable. And we said that that was our hours of study. Along the vertical axis, we get our Y variable, which we said was the exam grade. Okay, I'm gonna start at zero here. And then the hours of study, I'm literally just gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, because it goes from one to nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. 
And then along the horizontal axis here, or horizontal axis, vertical axis here, we get exam scores. So it looks like it's gonna go from 50 to 88. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a break. And then I'm gonna start here at 50. Then I'll go up to 60. So 55, then 65, then 70, then 75, then 80, then 85, and then 90. Okay. Pausing for a sip of my, my soda. And then all you have to do here is, is you literally just plot these as ordered pairs. Okay. So 150. So along the x axis, you're going to go 1 to 50 here. 2, 54. So we're going to eyeball this a little. 2 to 54. Come on. And then three to 60. So I'm going to go over to three and then up to 60. Four to 65. Do you guys see what I'm doing here? Yes. Okay. And, and then six to 78. So I'll skip five, six, go up to a 78. Seven, 82. 8.85 and then finally 9.88 and it wasn't not great but not my best work yeah go on ahead Julia you can ask anytime um I'm just wondering what's is the only difference between this and like a dot plot that this has like a relationship and dot plot is just like so a dot, plot, a dot plot is a little different right like a a dot plot, um, you only have one variable for a dot plot, right? Like okay. uh, where you notice how this has two variables. Yeah. So that's 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 how it's different. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, so when you see this, right? What we said was um, this definitely looks like a positive relationship, for sure. Um, but we also, we also want to describe this with another word that starts with L. Does anyone know a math term that would describe a graph that looks like this? Starts with an L? Linear. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thank you. It looks like a linear relationship. Okay. And so basically what we're gonna do over the next week and a half is study linear relationships, okay? That, that's, that's, that's where we're going. We're gonna, we're gonna develop what's called a linear correlation coefficient, and then we're gonna do what's called least squares linear regression, okay? Uh, good news, actually great news. Um, your calculator will also do this for you as well, all right? So what I wanna do now is I want us to all do this together in our calculator. So let's grab your trusty calculator uh, right here, okay? So when you're gonna input this in your calculator, you'll notice I have, this is what the calculator graph is gonna show us. Um, everybody grab your calculator and what we have to first do is we have to input the data into our calculator. So hit your stat button and under edit here to input under number one, hit enter. And then if you have any previous data in here, like under L1, just go to the top and clear it out. Okay, clear it out. Now we said this was our X variable and this was our Y variable. Now this is incredibly important. You're always gonna put your X variable in list one and your Y variable will always go into list two. Always, always. And you have to put them in the correct paired order, okay? So under L1, let's just start, let's start putting in these numbers, okay? One, two, three, four, 
six, seven, eight, and nine. Now scroll over, take your, hit your, hit your arrow button here, and we're gonna have to put these numbers in. 50, 54, 60, 65, 78, 82, 85, and 88. All right, it's like super important that everything is matched up perfectly. Okay, you'll get an error if it's not. Okay, so it needs to be matched up perfectly. How many people are with me and have on their calculator what I have here? Okay, a couple people. Good, good, good. A few people are probably like, I started Cobra Kai as soon as you said that, so no. Um, that was a joke. I find that people, you guys don't find my jokes funny anymore, which is a shame, but I find my dry humor to be, to be good for this class. I laugh. It's just like the switching of like unmuting is just too much. So I just like laugh behind. <laughs> no, no. You know what guys, I'm going to rewrite the exam and make it really hard. You guys, I don't believe you guys. Oh no, don't do that. Please. I laugh at all your jokes. I'm no, gonna... it's going to be super. It's the hardest exam I've ever written. You can redo it. No, that's a joke, actually. It's a joke. Oh. Um, the, no, that's cool. You know what? To be honest with you, all the jokes are already, or all the jokes, all the exams are already written. So that's, a, that's an empty threat. And I will make that threat all the time, but you can all, you can all just dismiss it, okay? All right, anyways, to go back here. Um, as long as you have this paired up like this, we're gonna go back into our stat plot now. Okay, so everybody hit second function, and then stat plot again. So you should see your plot one as dot, dot, dot on, okay? You're gonna hit enter. And for many of you, you should, it should say on, but under type, if you didn't change it from the previous example, you should see that, it, that this is what's highlighted. But if you look at type here, do you see this, this, this plot right here where my mouse is? Does that, that kind of looks like the scatter plot I just drew. So everybody with your mouse, go over to this one and just hit enter, make sure it's on, okay? So what you should see is plot one on type, it should be this selected. And then you'll notice what it says here. It says, what are your X variables? It should say L1. What are your Y variables or your Y list? It should say L2. So the problem with your calculator is it's always zoomed to the previous example. So everybody go back to the zoom button on your calculator, zoom, and you want option number nine here again, zoom set. You'll notice every time we input new data and do a graph, we always go back and hit zoom number nine. And hit and enter. This, go on ahead. Oh God, don't hit enter. Did you have a question, Bob? No, that's all right. Okay. Do you see this or not? No, I keep getting quit. That's all right. Thank you. Bob, generally what ends up happening is you generally the most common issue is under edit. You you don't you don't have the list lined up perfectly. That's generally the most common issue. The second one is that your stat plot is actually not on, it's off. So you just have to make sure it says on. All right, but you, you should hopefully see this. So uh, I have some good news, bad news. Uh, good news is um, on your homework, you're gonna have to do it by hand. Or maybe that's the bad news, I guess. Uh, uh, the good news is like on an exam, I'll never ask you to like produce the, these graphs for me, okay? Like all the graphing stuff are only gonna be on homeworks, okay? All right, but it's important to be able to see these graphs as it'll help us with our analysis as, as stuff goes on. Okay, so how many people just in the chat did see this graph on their calculator? I did. Okay, a couple people. Okay, good, good, good. 
All right, so um, scatter diagrams or scatter plots are really important because they explain the relationship. Okay, so whenever you see a scatter plot that's going like this, going upward like this, or downward like this, what's going on is it's explaining the relationship. Okay, it's saying, look, in this case here, we have both a linear relationship. If you have a scatter plot that looks like this, okay, it's explaining the relationship, okay? It's just saying, look, you're, the relationship is nonlinear. It looks like a, a parabolic relationship. And this one right here, this is also explaining the relationship. Again, it's not, it doesn't look like exactly like a linear relationship. It looks kind of like a cubic relationship. And believe it or not, if you have a scatter plot that just looks like a complete mess all over the place, data is just all over the place, that scatter, scatter plot does explain the relationship between the variables, believe it or not. And all that scatter plot is saying, guess what? I'm explaining to you that there is no relation between the variables. So these scatter plots are our first like key step for identifying um, the relationship between two variables. Like we looked at this relationship here and it looks like it's a linear relationship, okay? Now, two variables uh, that are linear relation, linear related are what's called positively associated. Okay, now this is a little bit wordy and it's basically when above average values of one variable are associated with above average values of the other variable and below average values of one variable are associated with below average variables of the other one. What the heck does that mean? It just means when X increases, so does Y increase. Okay, and you're seeing uh, this is this positive relationship. And what you're seeing here is it slopes upward. You can have the same deal with negatively associated variables. I'm not even gonna read through the, the definition here again, but it's just the same thing. When X increases, Y decreases, okay? So this is the negative linear relationship and it slopes downward. So if, if the variables go in the same direction, meaning they both increase or both decrease together, it's positive when they go in the opposite direction. So when one goes up, the other one goes down, that's a negative linear relationship. All right, so what I wanna do now with the 15 minutes we have left uh, is I wanna talk incredibly briefly about just going back real quick, um, how we measure the strength of a linear relationship. Okay, so to measure the strength of a linear relationship, we use what's called the linear correlation coefficient. Okay, it's sometimes referred to as the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. That's what some textbooks call it. But I'll always find, I'll always call it the linear correlation coefficient, or you might actually just sometimes hear me just say, uh, find the measure of correlation. And so this, this linear correlation coefficient is a measure of the strength and direction of the relationship between two quantitative variables. So this calculation that I tell you, or that I'm gonna show you how to do, um, measures how strong the linear relationship is um, in what direction, meaning if it's a positive or a negative. So we use, there's two types of linear correlation coefficients. There's a population one and a sample. So we use the Greek letter rho for a population coefficient and we use R to represent a sample correlation coefficient. This is the one that the only one we're gonna calculate in class. Um, we're never even gonna do a population one, okay? Um, just because there's no real, no, nothing really interesting to 
conclude from a popul population correlation coefficient. It's more how we work with sample data. All right, so let me give you the formula for this on the next slide, okay? And this is the formula for R, okay? This uh, sample linear correlation coefficient. So R is equal to, it's the sum, remember that's the sum. You're gonna take each X value, subtract away the mean, divide by the standard deviation, multiplying that by each Y value, um, subtracted away uh, y, each Y value minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation of Y. You'll take that calculation and sum it up, and then you'll divide by N minus one, okay? Does this formula look easy to use, easy to do? No. Piece of cake, are you kidding me? I already got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> The truth it reminds is, me of the y1 minus y2 formula. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. This is not easy. This is terrible. I like n plus one better. <laughs> so the reason I put it up here is, look, I'm, we're going to calculate these linear correlation coefficients, and there is some formula working behind the scenes on this, um, but we're, we're not going to do this by hand. It's a complete waste of time, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to use technology to find this. Can get that going. Copy in. Okay, well, I'm going to show you the how to use your TI calculator for this. And um, if we have time next week, I'll spend ten minutes just showing you. Thank God, that's funny, Julia. I'll show. I'll spend a couple of minutes just showing you how to do this in Microsoft Excel, um, just because you never know when 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 you'll need to use that, and it's and it's somewhat helpful. Okay, so let me give you the properties of this. Okay, before we calculate it, um, what are some things to know about this linear correlation coefficient? Um, the linear correlation coefficient is always between negative one and one inclusive. Okay, so you will never calculate this and have it be a value like two or negative 10. Okay, it's always, always, always between negative one and one. Okay. And it can be anything in between that. It could be negative 0 0.8347 or 0 0.99999. It can be anything in between. If R is equal to plus one, uh, there is a perfect positive linear relationship exists between the two variables, okay? That means the scatter plot legit looks like a straight line, a perfect straight line sloping upward. If R is equal to negative one, then there's a perfect negative linear relationship. It means it would look like a perfect straight line sloping downward. The closer R is to plus one, the stronger is the evidence of a positive association between the two variables. Okay, like if it was 0.8 or 0.9. And the closer R is to negative one, the stronger the evidence of a negative association between the two variables. If R is close to zero, what that means is there's little or no evidence exists of a linear relationship between the two variables. So this is important. If R is close to zero, it does not imply there is no relationship, just that there is no linear relationship between the variables. All right, um, the linear correlation coefficient, it's a unitless measure. Uh, so the units of measure of X and Y play no role in the interpretation of R. So like hours of study and exam scores, the measurement for that don't does not matter one bit. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going so fast. I just want to get to this last thing before class ends. So I'm trying to get through this for in 10 minutes, okay? All right, so what do different values of this R look like? Okay, so here was this R is equal to one. The scatter plot, you can see it's like a perfect straight line. And R is equal to negative one. It's a perfect straight line going down. Here's th these two right here, you can see this is R is equal to positive 0.9 and R is equal to 0 0.4. When R is equal to 0.9, you can like straight up see the linear positive relationship. It's, it's very evident in the data. Do you notice when R is equal to 0.4, you can still see that the data is sloping upward, but it's just more spread out. 
Do you guys, do, do you all notice that? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I mean. Like when R is 0.9, it's like a nice tight band going up. And then as R gets further away from positive one, it, the, the data is still going upward, but the band gets, gets um, wider. It's the same thing on the negative side. This is negative 0 0.9 and this is negative 0.4. Like you can negative 0.9, you can see the relationship going down whoosh, like this. And negative 0.4 value of R, you could still see the relationship. Okay. But it's but the data is a lot more spread out. And look, here's here's two R values that are close to zero. Here there is no relationship between the variables, they're all spread out. And this one here, this has an R value close to zero, but there for sure is a relationship. It's just a parabolic relationship and the linear correlation coefficient does not pick that up. Okay, it doesn't pick it up. Okay. So what I wanna do now in the eight minutes we have left is I wanna calculate the value of the linear correlation coefficient um, for our example, okay? All right, so let me go back for a second here, okay? This is what our scatter plot looked like, okay? So R is gonna measure the strength of the linear relationship here, okay? And this is what we're noticing here, okay? This looks like a positive linear relationship. positive linear relationship. Do you think the value of R should be close to positive one or negative one for this example? Positive one. Yeah, okay. Yep, perfect. Yep, it's sloping upward and you can like really see that linear path here. All right, so to do this, it's a little bit of a pain in the, the tuchus here um, to, to set this up on your calculator, okay? So everybody grab their calculator. It doesn't matter if you have the TI-83 or the TI-84, okay? I'm gonna show you how to reset, uh, put this in your calculator. Unfortunately, what you all have to do, your calculator, the default setting is not to calculate the linear correlation or the linear the value of r the linear correlation coefficient so what you have to do is you have to change a default setting okay everybody on their calculator does everybody see down at the bottom above the zero key there's this thing called catalog catalog do you all see that i got melissa says yeah yes okay everybody hits second function zero to get catalog here second function zero So you'll notice it starts in the A's. Did you do that again? Yep, yep, yep. Hit your second function key, Bob, and then z the zero button. Okay. Thank you. Yep. You're looking for something called diagnostic on. Okay, now here's the thing. You could scroll all the way down to the D's, but that sounds terrible. Do you notice on your calculator in green here, you see all these letters on your calculator? Do you, guys, do you ever notice that? So there's this, do you see this X with a negative one there? Do you notice how that's next to the D? Everybody just press your X inverse button and it should take you to the Ds and scroll down till you see this thing called diagnostic on. Okay, diagnostic on, diagnostic on. And then just hit enter. Okay, how many people did that with me? I did. Awesome, Melissa, Bob, okay. All right. 
Incredibly important that you followed along and did that, okay? So now I'm gonna go back to my TI-84, okay? Just my TI, if you have the TI-83, it's the same thing, okay? Click your stat button, okay? You should, you should still have the data saved in your calculator. Everybody should have the data saved in their calculator. So scroll over to calc. Does everybody see option number four? It says Linreg AX plus B. Does everybody see that option number four? Yes. Okay, everybody go down and click option number four. Now, if you have a TI-83, okay, if you have a TI-83, it just says on your screen, Linreg AX plus B, just hit enter, okay? If you have a TI-84, just scroll down to calculate, and you should see something that looks like this, okay? How many people see this on their screen? Anybody else? couple. Beatrice, do you just see A and B? Is that what you see? Beatrice? Yep, you're going to go second function catalog. You're going to click this X inverse button. And you're gonna scroll down to diagnostic on. I'm gonna stay after class because it was only two minutes and I'll help anybody else, okay? I just wanna go through the, with the time we have. And then I promise I'll stay after class and help anybody. Okay, A and B I'll go over next class. R squared is what's called the coefficient of determination. We're not gonna talk about it that much in this class. We're not gonna talk about it at all actually. But the coefficient of determination explains um, what percentage of the variation in, in the Y variable can be explained by the variation in the X variable. But for our class, all we're interested in is this value of R today. So that R right there is the linear correlation coefficient and it's 0 0.9943. So I'll just go to four decimal places. So what this is saying, because it's so close to positive one, it's telling us there is strong evidence of a positive linear relationship here. All right, and that's officially class time, but don't stress too much about it. Like we're gonna just practice this a ton. Okay, um, on Thursday, we're just going to spend more and more time with our calculator. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll definitely get there. Okay, everybody. So I'm going to stop the, the class. It's officially over. So if you want to leave, you can, but I'll stick around and help anybody who's having trouble with their calculator. Okay, so I'll stop the recording.